guys, this is your emergency action message book. We're going to flip it open to a blank page, and we're going to write down that message as it comes in right up there at the top. And then the guy on the message is going to say, and I repeat. So commander and deputy will swap their books and write down that message a second time. And then we'll all compare and make sure that everybody wrote down the same thing. So did you both get the same message? Yes. All right. So as communications officer here, deputy is going to decode just the very first line of that message before they turn and look at our commander and say, sir, this is a launch order. All right, what do we got to do now? What's our first step? What do you guys think? <clears throat> Power the missile up. Push the button, bring the missile up. All pretty good ideas. Officially, our first step here is to verify. We want to make sure it's a real order before we do anything else. And we're going to do that by going to our red safe right here. Now that's the emergency war order safe, and it's got two locks on it. Those belong to commander and deputy, respectively. When you got this job, you had been handed that lock, told to put in a code that no one would ever guess. And when you weren't at work, it was expected to be on your person at all times, even when you were asleep. But today, we're going to take those locks off, and we're going to pull out two items from that safe. The first is a set of keys. Because the only place we launch a nuclear weapon with a big red button is in Hollywood. <laughs> in the real world, we use keys. Those are already in our councils, one right here on Commander's Council, and the other is on the other side of the Deputy's Council, way over here. Now, the second thing we're going to get out of our safe are these guys. There's about two dozen envelopes in there that look something like this. They all have two characters in the upper corner, and one of them should correspond to the first two characters of our message. Let's say it was this one. We're going to find the right envelope, we're going to crack it open, and we're going to pull out more code. Yay! We're going to take this line of code right up here at the top, and we're going to match it to that first line of code in our message. And if they're the same, well, then we have a verified order. We know that it's real. It's an early form of two-factor authentication. And now that we know we have a real order, Deputy here can move on with decoding the rest of the message so we can find out exactly what it is they need us to do. Now there could be some extra information in there if they wanted us to make some sort of change to the way our system is set up, but at a minimum, and usually, this message just has two things in it. The first is our launch time. Because we've been told if they ever launched one Titan missile, we were launching all 54. And you can't launch 54 missiles of this size all at the exact same time. So to make sure we don't get it wrong, Deputy is going to write that time across the base of this clock right here so everyone can see it. That's a 24-hour military time Zulu clock. Zulu is the same as Greenwich Mean Time, the time zone from which all time zones originate, but it is not impacted by time zones AM, PM, or daylight savings. All military installations around the globe use Zulu, and we always conduct military maneuvers in Zulu time. Now, the second piece of information we're going to get out of our message here is something called a butterfly valve lock code. It's going to correspond to this guy right here. That's our butterfly valve lock. And that corresponds to this guy right here, our butterfly valve. Now, it's a pretty simple mechanism. works like this. Open and close. They're usually on fuel lines, water lines, things like that, that need to be held shut. We have four of them on our missile. Two on our fuel lines and two on the oxidizer lines. And that's because the propellant on a Titan II is hypergolic. That means it's got two liquid components that will ignite on contact. So it's pretty important to keep those guys separate until we actually want to launch this missile. You also can't launch your missile at all if you can't mix those liquids, which is why they put a lock on it. And that is such an important security feature for this rocket. The only people who have those codes are the Pentagon. And the only time you're going to see this code as a crew is if you're actually launching your missile. Which means we're going to have to verify, right? Deputy's going to give the code to Commander. Commander will read it off to the BMAT. BMAT will insert it into the lock and press the test button. If that light turns green, we have a verified code. And we now have everything we need to launch our missile. Only thing left to do is wait for the launch time to get here. But like we said earlier, we probably don't have long to wait. All right, before we move on with that thought, I did want to point out that there's one particularly important piece of information that we haven't gotten yet. Did you guys catch what it was? Where's it going? Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's no coordinates or destination, and that's because targets on a Titan II are pre-programmed. The computer already knows where they are. So right up here on Commander's Console, we can see where it says target one, target two, and target three. 
Now one of those should be lit up. Which one is it? Target two. Two, because as far as we know, this silo has always been aimed at target two. Now do either of you know for a fact where target two is? Nope. We don't know. Soviet Union? Russia. Russia, Soviet Union, yeah. Probably. We don't know exactly. Do you guys think the crew would know? Nope. That's right. Crew had no idea. They only knew these targets as one, two, and three. There's two reasons. First one is security. This information was classified at such a high level during this time, it's still classified today. I still don't know those locations. <coughs> it's definitely about crew member pay grade. Now, our second reason here is actually going to be psychological, because it turns out it's a lot easier to turn that key if you don't know where it's going. So they kept it from the crews. Now, of course, if there were orders, they could change it from two to three or three to one or whatever but they're still not gonna actually know where it's going, and that was probably for the best. Alrighty, folks, we were just waiting on that launch time to get here, so let's say that it has. What's gonna happen next is commander's gonna give an abbreviated countdown for themselves and their deputy, but they both turn their keys to initiate that launch sequence. Once we turn those keys, it's only gonna take an additional 58 seconds for this missile to launch. And once we turn those keys, there is no stopping this launch. There is no abort procedure, there is no self-destruct. Even if the president himself ordered you to stop, you've already turned those keys, you've got two words for him. Sorry, sir. Now, if we turn the keys, computer will take over the rest of this launch. We're gonna get a series of lights across the top of the console here telling us what's going on. First one is launch enabled, pretty self-explanatory. Followed by batteries activated. There are two dry batteries on our missile. They've never been charged, so we're gonna start charging them now. It's gonna take 28 seconds, and it might just be the longest 28 seconds of your life. At the end of that time, APS power lets us know batteries are charged. Followed by silo soft. That's our silo door opening. It's gonna take 17 seconds, break its own alarm system, which we'll hear. Then we get Guidance Go. Guidance system is on these panels right here, and like we said, it's all pre-programmed, so the computer and the missile are just gonna talk for the very last time. After that, a klaxon is gonna go off nice and loud. Now, normally that's a fire alarm to alert the crew to a fire down in the silo, but in this case, we want that fire, because that's fire engines. Our very last light, of course, will be liftoff. And now that I have bored you all to tears with this information, you guys ready to see it happen in real time? No? No. <laughs> well, are you guys ready to launch a missile? Yep. Yes. Okay. Commander and Deputy, if you will place your left hand on your key. Commander, you're going to give us a big three, two, one launch. We're both going to turn your keys to the right and hold it for five seconds. Whenever you're ready. And in three, two, one, turn. Alright, you guys can sit back. Your jobs are now done. We got our first couple lights right up here. Launch enable. Batteries activated. We're now in that 28 second wait period. So cue the Jeopardy theme. You let me know when that light comes on. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't fit, but it does. It's a bad thing. APU power on. Batteries are fully charged. Next up, we should get... Silo soft. Silo door is open. And what we should also have? Guidance go. Guidance go. We're communicating with the missile for the very last time. It knows where it is and where it's going. It'll take just a few more seconds for all those systems to finish calibrating before hopefully we get something that sounds like that. Fire engine. Followed by... Lift off. Yeah. Exactly. It actually does. That's pretty close to what a launch would have felt like from inside of this room. You wouldn't have heard it, felt it, or seen it. That's how well shock isolated we are and how good the blasters are at doing their job. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Alrighty, folks, I do want to talk for just a minute here about what it is we've just done. Now, I did say earlier that it's going to take about 30 to 35 minutes for a missile this size to reach its target. So in about half an hour, we as a crew will have obliterated an area of approximately 900 square miles. That's an area 30 miles in diameter and larger than Los Angeles and its suburbs. It's actually larger than any city on the planet. 
and it's all gonna be gone, like that. Absolutely nothing will survive. No people, no animals, not even a building. There will be nothing left but dust and a giant hole in the ground. And all in the name of peace. That's a lot of responsibility, and it's a lot of weight to carry on your shoulders. Especially for our crew members who were typically between the ages of 18 and 25. Can you imagine having this as your very first job out of high school or out of college? I don't know about you folks, it wouldn't have been my first choice. Alright, let's lighten up for just a second because free souvenirs are the best souvenirs. These